All right, if you would read with me this morning, we're going to go to Romans. This is one of my favorite scriptures, and I use this a lot because it's such a, um, it's such a picture of my life. You know, we find that one scripture that fits our entire life, and it just speaks to us. So I'm going to try to read this without getting tongue-tied. I typically get the words backwards. My wife always tells me, just slow down. I'm a high-strung person. That's difficult to do. So I'm going to slow down. For we, that's us. Is that slow enough? For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. (sighs) For I know that nothing good dwells within me. That's kind of powerful, isn't it? Nothing good dwells? Yuck. That is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now you're understanding why I get confused. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin... He condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled within us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Tell me we're done. Now you understand. Why does he like that passage? It's so confusing, right? Pray with me before we get started. Father God, please don't get my words. Get backwards. Lord, bless us this morning as we come and we listen to your words. I pray that the next few minutes, God, are just your thoughts. Uh, I ask for the wisdom to hear and see. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So I need to share a little story with you before we get going on this. Um, and In fact, I was going to pick on him today, but Bo Whitaker's not here. Uh, Bo is, I've been in Coleman, which I, I, I mentioned earlier, and Bo had been the pastor there. Bo did not tell me they use wine in communion. This gets funny. Now, this church has a lot of traditions. So in the very beginning, there's a lot of uh, rituals where we go back and forth, a lot of uh, between the congregation and the pastor, different, different things that they say, different prayers that they use. And they're beautiful. They really are. But it takes a long time. So let me build you this up. For 45 minutes, we prayed back and forth, worked with one another. We sang out of the hymnal all 15 verses. Sometimes we back up and start back over in case we didn't get one of the 15 in there. So I'm not used to all this, and, and it's really, I'm learning as we're going along, and it's really, it's neat. It's great to be a part of, but they don't warn you ahead of time that you're leading all that. They hand you this script and say, here you go. And I'm like, who does all that? Well, you do. Here I am back leading again, singing out of a hymnal. They introduced me to the hymnal, by the way. So we get through all that part, and we come to communion. Now, mind you, I have a picture of this. Where's that bulletin I handed you, Steve? Communion is two pages long. Y'all think I'm kidding. I can't find it. I brought a bulletin back to you. Communion starts out like this. First thing we do is we have a prayer before we get started. It's, it's one that we read back and forth. And then there is um, a reading together. And then there is the 
uh, communion statement, if you will, from the minister or leader. And then there is the presiding over the table. The elders speak. So communion is really a big deal to them. That's really what their, their service is about, which is great. That's what it is. It's a beautiful thing. But I didn't read all that. So the first week into it, I see communion statement. I'm thinking, okay, I say this we I do like we do at Wiley, and we roll right into communion. So that's the first mistake that I made. The second one is as I'm reading and I'm, I'm breaking the bread and I'm talking about the body of Christ, and then I go over and I, I pour the cup because they have these beautiful uh, brass uh, vases and, and beautiful cups, and and and, and we're, I'm, I'm pouring it in there and I'm going, <laughs> smells like wine. And I'm like, well, that's kind of neat. They actually use wine for this part of it. Well, then we take communion, and I take the bread, and they serve the minister first, so I get served first. And I take the bread, and I ate it, and I take that, and I'm, whoo, that's wine. That's, that's wine. My wife is in the back row with my grandkids who love communion. I just sat there and watched. I was like, this is going to be funny. My grandson grabs one. What we did not know, if you'd read in the small fine print, grape juice is in the middle. But we didn't know that, so we just grabbed a communion train. Nobody said a word. Not even the people passing out. Hey, the grape juice is right there for the kids. So Jace grabs wine. Ah! Yes. Expression on his face was absolutely priceless. I was trying not to laugh because this is a very serious moment for this church. But I learned, read everything on the, the bulletin, especially if there's a chance of wine being in there. So that was my first week, and they actually invited me back. The next two weeks, I got it right, and I knew where the grape juice was, and I knew where the wine was. But it was quite an experience. So why am I telling you that story? Experiences change us, and that's what Paul's talking about in this passage. As we learn... We don't make the same mistakes twice because we don't want to. Now, granted, the next week I was looking forward to the wine. I was going to get there early and help them with communion. They just didn't tell me the first time, right? <laughs> so we go through it, and, and the next two weeks are, are, are great, and, and I know where the grape juice is, and I tried both. One week I did the wine, one week I did the grape juice, and I can tell you right now, I really like grape juice better than wine. There's, there's just something about communion wine. It's just not that great. Uh, it's, it's, it's fine if you like it. It is, but I, I've decided I really do like the grape juice. Sangria in a box isn't that good. I, it could have been. I have no idea. They would not show me where it was. I was volunteering to get there early to help them with it. I told them they would enjoy the sermon better. But <laughs> So in this passage, we're talking about change and things like that. Uh, I spoke with this a couple weeks ago when I used this passage in, at, at Coleman. And this was, this was kind of my, my, one of my, my illustrations on this. In this story, you've got Paul talking about as we start to develop and change in life, the things that we used to embrace and enjoy, we don't tend to do that. Now, there's times when we want to go back to what we were or what we used to be because it's comfortable. And Paul goes on to say, it's really not you, it's your experiences or your sin. When he talks about the sin, he's talking about the experiences we have in life. And, and in this passage, what I take from all this is that as we develop and learn, we want to learn more. We want to grow. And if you read the whole passage, it goes through to tell us that in the end, no matter where we are in our life, that the ultimate sacrifice was through Christ and that we are forgiven and redeemed through Christ. But along that journey, we're going to go through things in our lives that are going to change us, that is going to challenge us, and we're going to struggle in those. And most of that struggle is going to be with who we were, what we used to be, and what we're comfortable with doing. When I was a kid, the first time that I, I learned to write, you remember learning to write and, and draw pictures? And you would draw something for your mom or dad that would just say something like, I love you. And, and, and it, it would say, like, I love mommy. And half of them would be capitalized, half the letters wouldn't be. And if there was any drawing on there, part of it was outside of the lines, part of it was inside of the lines. And as a parent, it's a beautiful picture, right? 
It's great. We looked at that picture and we fell in love with it. In fact, we liked it so much, we put it on the refrigerator or hung it up somewhere at work where we could see it and say, hey, our kids did this. We're excited because our kids are learning a little bit. Because you know why? We, we, we know the journey and we know where that leads, right? So we can be proud, and, and that's much like in this story. Uh, I feel like God, even in our struggles, is proud of us when we're, we're learning to change, kind of like that parent. He knows that the struggles are there and it's going to happen, and, and, and why do I say that? Because when we start to get older, when we were a kid and we were doing math, if we wrote 2 plus 2 and it came out to 5, we didn't care. We were just trying something. We were having a good time. But when we got into school and we started learning the, the theories um, and, and the facts behind it and, 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 and the ways that, that math worked and all the formulas that came along, we started to, to, to put numbers in places and we started to understand that 2 plus 2 is 4 and there's a reason for that and we started to color in the lines and we got frustrated when we would get outside of the lines or we didn't make a good grade on that paper and we'd get mad and say I just can't do math I just can't do this or I can't write that well the teacher doesn't like my writing and, and you know what it was it wasn't the fact that we were angry with the teacher or anything like that we were angry with the struggle within us because we were learning something new and we knew it's something that we wanted but it was a challenge to get it down and to learn it we didn't want to color outside of the lines anymore. We wanted to color in the lines. And when we took a test, we wanted that A because we've been taught as a society that an A is the benchmark that we aim for, right? And that's sometimes so wrong. And if we could just flip it around and see it from the opposite side as the parent that just said, you're really doing good. You're on a long road that's going to take a long time to get there. Slow down breathe and enjoy the journey but we don't do that do we we're, we're quick we're fast we want to learn so where's the balance in all that it's a lot of what paul's talking about this is the balance in all this knowing that the ultimate price has already been paid we read that in chapter eight but chapter seven is about the struggle chapter eight is the great ending to a wonderful story that the flesh christ became flesh and that the sin and flesh has been redeemed. It has been condemned through the ultimate sacrifice. But along the way, there's this big thing in life. It's a journey. And we learn from our experiences. And we go back and we have our struggles. And then I, I, I hear people all the time say, well, you know, so-and-so, uh, they, they, they can't, they don't, they don't, they make poor decisions. They don't get things right, you know, and we don't know where they're, where they've been in that journey we don't know where they're at. My wife is a is a high school principal. She taught for eight years before she did that. So she's got this great experience with the kids and this great experience as an administrator to help the teachers with the kids. So she has this great perspective. And we were kind of talking this week, and she was mentioning something. She said, you know, the sad part about it is the state sees the children as the ability and says they're going to learn all at the same pace. And that's just not the truth. And in this passage... Paul tells us that we're going to struggle. We're not going to learn at the same rate, the same pace. And if we read other passages, we're not called to do that. And that we're not supposed to do that. That each one of us, our journey in life is different. And that our struggles are different. And that they can't be the same. And that we will have opportunities to learn and grow. But we're going to have opportunities to, to fail just as simple. And, and it's all coming back to that seeing the end passage and understanding that God is just excited you're taking the journey. That God is just excited that you chose to be here on a Sunday morning. Now, it's just that simple, but what happens in that? When you come, you get blessed, right? And you want to grow, and you want to hear something new, and you want to hear what, the, what, what, what maybe Doug has to say on a Sunday that might touch or help you change, or more importantly, might help you understand your journey and your struggle in this passage. Because I believe in life, we're on this passage. This scripture, more than anything, I think fits our lives from beginning to end. Because I'm not the man I used to be. And I'm not the person I'm going to be. And I'm going to struggle between those two. I'm going to struggle between the old that I knew that was comfortable, just like when, 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 oh, when they wandered in the desert and they cried out for manna, and they actually said for a moment, and Doug talked about this for a few weeks ago, if only we could go back as slaves, we ate, we were happy, we had plenty of food, 
Really? You were miserable in that life. Do you remember what it was like? Kind of like, sometimes I think, God, I wish I could go back 20 years ago. It was so much easier. Really? Do you want to go through what you just went through again? Do you really want to do that? No, we change. Our circumstances in life sometimes are our choice. Sometimes they're not our choices. So we find ourselves on a different road, and sometimes those roads aren't comfortable. Sometimes those roads are not what we ask for, and sometimes we look at it and we say, God, how did I get here? How did I get here? <laughs> and God's got two answers for you. One is, I don't know. The other is, um, do you remember when you decided this? Or you chose that? With every blessing, and I love this, Doug says this, with every blessing there comes a burden. And with every decision that you make, you choose one thing, you give something else up in order to make that happen. And sometimes journeys in life start with one step, and they start to snowball. And the next thing you know, we're really on this road that we had no idea how in the world we got here, some good, some bad. I have no idea how I'm 43 and I have three grandchildren. That was not on my road. I mean, I remember my map. But you know what? My life changed. And I'll tell you right now, my life's better. I promise you that. I've been more blessed with grandkids than I have anything else. Now, did I see that coming? No. Did I struggle with it? Yeah, I struggled with it. I struggle with letting my kids go. I struggle with knowing that they're going to be parents on their own and they're not that old. And I struggled because I had walked that road. But I let it go. Because I realized in the end I don't have any control to change any of that. But I do have the power to be a part of it. To be a blessing to embrace that blessing. I realize that along the way, when we find ourselves in these, these, these valleys, if you will, that the only reason we understand it's a valley is because there was something higher that we had experienced that told us something else felt better than this. And what I discovered is when I got in these valleys, I had to stop for just a minute and say, I remember this. And this was amazing. So how do I get back there from here? And everybody's decision is different. But it's that same journey. And when you find yourself in that pitfall, in that, that struggle, in, in that, that thing we call life, you, you, you start to look and you start to try to change. Or you do the other. You just stay down there and you give up and you say, ah, I can't do this. That's when Paul says, you don't have to stay here because the greatest gift you've got is Christ Jesus who died on a cross, who became just like you, who experienced everything that you're going through who was just a man he was born of flesh and died of flesh experienced what you and I experienced the struggles remember in the garden when he said Lord if there's any other way I love that prayer but at the same time he said I will be done. He understood what had to happen. But that didn't stop him from crying out and wondering out loud. Or at least that's what the gospel tells us. That he had that same struggle in that moment where he knew his life was about to go really downhill. But he stayed the course. And staying the course is what it's all about. Because eventually, if you stay on that road map, no matter where that leads you, 
and as you learn and as you grow and you keep taking the challenges in life. And that's part of living is taking the challenges in life. Because once you've had an experience, you can't go back and experience that ever, ever, ever again, right? All that did was lead you open to a new experience in life and what was going to be around the corner for you next. And sometimes that last experience, Doug talks about this, our biggest hindrance from the next experience with God is our last experience because we're stuck right there enjoying it instead of saying, okay, I got to get out of the boat and I got to see if I'm going to walk on water or if I'm going to go underwater. Either way, it's going to be a journey because if I go underwater, somebody's going to have to get me out. Right? And if I walk on water, somebody's going to have to help me do that because I can't do that. And I'm starting to see a common theme in all that. Are you seeing the theme? What happens when you go underwater? Somebody's going to reach down a hand and pull you up. What happens when you get the ability to walk on water? Pardon? Yeah. God's got a hand in all of it, doesn't he? He gives you the ability sometimes to feel like you're walking on water. And that life is wonderful. And then he gives us the experience of falling in the water and understanding how much better it feels to be. Or we can just stay in the boat and float. How many of you know people staying in that boat floating? Man, they're struggling, aren't they? Well, today I want you to be that hand that reaches out and grabs them and yanks them out of the boat. See what they do. If they fall underwater, reach out. Grab them. Pull them back up. If they walk, walk with them. Hold their hand. Bring them in here. Come on. This is a great place to worship. I mean, the energy in this church is unreal. Unreal. The excitement, the enthusiasm. I mean, when I walked in the door this morning, I just, I just seeing Wiley, I was like, yeah. But you know why? Because of the highs that I've had here and the experiences that I've had and the fun that I've had and the love that I've seen and the people that come in this door, that come in this door excited about being here, the people that come in this door struggling every single week, wondering, God, how did I do that again? Have you ever found yourself in that place? How did I do that again? Why do I keep doing that over? You know the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the exact, expecting a different result. Because if you do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, you're going to get the exact same result. Bible studies that are growing. A church breakfast that started how many years ago? A church that went from one Sunday evening a month to every Sunday pack in and pack out with a Korean church to a church that got brave enough to rent the building by themselves to a church that got brave enough to buy the building to a church that got brave enough to continue to give to the Boys and Girls Club their building that they had to someone else. Man, I don't see anybody staying in a boat here. Do you? And I don't see any of us staying where we used to be. A cleaning day on a Saturday. People up here cleaning on the, on the church when they could be home watching football. Texas and OU played yesterday. Did anybody see the score of that game? Who won that game? Did Texas win that game? Gosh, I didn't know that. I didn't remember that. Sorry, I, I, brain lapse. I didn't remember that. There I go. See, struggling with the old me. You get my point? I had a great time in Coleman, Texas. And it's a stretch for me to go there. Because it's so different. And there's so many things you want to say, but so many things that you want to respect. And I, re- I realized we, we have a lot of traditions here because I saw those traditions there. And I enjoy the traditions that we have here because they are such a beautiful experience. And, and like I said earlier, we are defined by our traditions, but our traditions don't define us. When we come in here, we understand we're going to praise and we're going to worship And, of course, being a disciple, we know we're going to take communion and we're going to have a wonderful moment with that. And it's going to be a great thing. 
But at the same time, what I discovered here is there's not one thing in the service that stands out and is more important than the other. What I discovered here is the fact that we came to worship together is the most important thing that happens on Sunday morning. And isn't that beautiful? No matter who's in the pulpit or who's up here playing or when the candles get lit or if they get lit or if I get the order of service backwards, it just doesn't matter. When you learn where you were, who you used to be, and you continue to grow, your mind changes as well. And the more experiences that you can have, good or bad, change you, sharpen you, challenge you, the experiences that you go through each and every day define your tomorrow. What happens to you the rest of the day will define who you are in the morning. What you choose to do the rest of the day will define who you are tomorrow. And the next day, and the next day, Paul goes on to say as we learn we understand that it's really, it's really not us. It's life. It's the experiences that we go through and how we choose to handle those and what we choose to do with our experiences today that define us as a person. As a Christian, I'm defined by my Jesus, a gift from my God. As a person... I'm defined by my actions and how I show that and my experiences. So the rest of the day, the rest of the week, and the rest of the lot, your life, you will be defined by what you do each and every moment. And I'm going to tell you right now, some of those uh, definitions won't be good. And we'll go, why did I act that way? And then some of them will be incredible. And you'll say, how did I act that way? Where did that come from? It came from you. It came from your experiences. It came from your belief. It came from the hope. And it came from the joy of knowing that in all of us, there's greatness. The song said, I'm half a man. I'm half a person. I'm half a woman. I'm half whatever. Come make me whole. And that's, to me, what this passage is. The fact that we come only as part of a person and that through Christ we are made whole and that we have the same abilities to be magnificent and the same abilities to be exactly who we are. So I challenge you. Keep learning. Keep growing. Understand that you want a color in the lines, not outside of the lines. And that you want to write in the little bitty, well, maybe the bigger squares now as we get a little older because the little bitty ones are a little bit harder to see. Maybe we want to write on the bigger pieces of paper. But we want, we want to. So be that hand this week that reaches out to somebody who's down. Or be that hand this week that just walks along somebody who's even up on the mountaintop. Because eventually, as high as that mountain is, there's going to be a pitfall. And they're going to need somebody to reach down and pick them up. So be that hand. Be that hand that hugs, loves, and encourages. Because we know what the other hand is, right? Together, we make a change in lives. Together, we continue the blessing that God gave us. And together, believe it or not, as a church, we can change the entire world. But just do it one person at a time, like this person. Would you pray with me?